Okay. So today, I will try to explain a rather difficult concept, let's see, that I put on, on the wall there, the so-called convulsive beauty, almost compulsive beauty. Uh, and uh, there is a connection between these two notions. Uh, it is, of course, a notion that was created by André Breton, uh, the uh, surrealist, the, the fundator of the surrealist movement. And uh, you, you, of course, he, to describe it or to define it, if you want, uh, you will not do it like uh, uh, a philosopher or a, a thinker. You will do it as a poet. And he will do it through uh, images, in fact. So it's like we will have few example of what he meant by this convulsive beauty and from there we will get a concept and then I will ask myself okay how this type of approach to beauty can relate to our <laughs> main subject each time with the uh, This time you will see that we will have to uh, roam a little bit further and uh, it's uh, maybe the connection is less evident than in, in previous uh, lectures. Uh, so the, the first uh, the first time that he mentioned this convulsive beauty, Breton, it's in the book, it's called Nadja. Uh, and as you know, Nadja was a kind of uh, seer or somebody who, who, could, who could read cards and could see the future and all that. And the surrealists have always been very intrigued by these mediums, you know. They, they went to consult them and they, the cartomancienne and all this. Uh, it was always a, a, a fascination with the tarot also and all this for them. So Nadja is the story of one of these uh, visionaires, if you want. And the, the, uh, his book finished by this phrase, the, the, the beauty will be convulsive or will not be. Uh, and then he didn't give any ex explanation of what he meant by that. And it's in the second book in Nadja, uh, in the L'Amour Fou, uh, that in 1937, he gave us this more, <laughs> even more enigmatic type of description of, of what it is. Composite will be veil erotic, so he, 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 he will get three concepts, if you want, to describe it. Uh, this fixed explosive and finally magical uh, encounter or circumstances, or will not be, so he takes exactly the same uh, structure of phrase, if you want, except that now you give us a little bit more. But it's still enigmatic, and if we didn't have all the images and the photos uh, that illustrate his books to get an idea of what he meant by that, I think it would be very difficult to, to know indeed. And he, he begins to describe the first concept, uh, this idea of a veil erotic. Uh, erotic, I think he associated mainly with life, and veil with a kind of uh, a way to dissimulate it, if you want, or even to fix it. Because uh, you will see the example he gave are troubling, in a way. The first one, he described a visit that he did in a cave in Vaucluse, so in the south of France, and uh, a cave with stalagmite and stalactite. And he says, uh, in one of these caves, uh, there was a fantastic phenomenon that these dri dripping of water from the ceiling we're creating a perfect egg in, in limestone, of course. Uh, it, 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 it looks like an egg in a little egg cup, uh, like we used to have it. I don't know if we still use that. They, we used to have this little egg cup, and you put our hard boiled lead in it, and <coughs> with a knife, you cut the, the less possible on the top, and then you put your, your salt or mayonnaise or whatever you like with it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and so Breton was. Uh, absolutely uh, fascinated by the fact that the stalag stalactite, instead of, of creating another one, let's say, were creating a perfect shape like this of an egg. This is one example he gave. The second one is another visit in a cave, but this time he says the two walls were in quartz. And instead of being in limestone, I guess it must have been fantastic also, near Montpellier. Uh, he says la grotte des fées, of a gr grotto of, of the fairies. There's thousands of them all over the world, of course. But this one was with these two walls of uh, quartz. And then he did one of the wall was so fantastic that you have, uh, they were putting some light on it, pink in a way. 
and it's, it's called the imperial mantle. Huh? Like it, it was a, a kind of a huge uh, mantle like this that you could see uh, from outside. Uh, the third example, then he could illustrate it with, uh, with a picture, and uh, Breton, of course, could afford to have uh, people like Man Ray or Brassai to make the illustration of his book. Uh, these are people who are great photographers, who are close to uh, the surrealist movement, and so he could, uh, he, he could see them, he, he could uh, ask them to help him to illustrate his book. And here what it is, it's as rather curious. The important thing is not the egg at, at the bottom here, it's rather this kind of uh, roots of mandrake, uh, this kind of magical plant that uh, have very often the shape, uh, human shape. Uh, these roots are taking easily human shape. And here he says, oh, well, it's like a little bit uh, Aeneas um, bearing on his shoulder his father. Right? It's a kind of uh, yeah, an allusion, let's say, to uh, a Virgil poem uh, on about Aeneas. Uh, as if you have two uh, persons there, one uh, bearing the other on his shoulders, a younger one, and his father being aged and being carried like this by his son. Uh, the uh, other example is this one, again, a photo by Man Ray, that he called uh, himself, he, he gave a title to the photo, Moi et Elle, uh, me and her. And uh, so you see in the middle a kind of strange statuette. Uh, he says it's in rubber, in rock rubber. And uh, it seems like a child a little bit. And uh, it have a gesture like this with the hand, uh, you see on the left. And uh, it's as if he was listening to something. See, like you put your, your hand like this near your ear to listen to something. And uh, he says, I don't know what it was. He bought it probably in a flea market somewhere or, or because the uh, surrealists were very good at this, they going to flea market or any type of uh, place where they, they sell odd things and things. And he was fascinated by this figure. He says, I thought it was um, a figure of bewitchment. Uh, but he said, I'm not sure of that. I have no idea where it come from. I, I just imagined that it had been used for be bewitchment. And uh, then the association with the cars there, Breton says that, that this little statuette, each time that he used it with cars, always speak immediately of him, of his life, of his uh, poetry and everything. And, and he says, so it becomes very, very personal to me. Uh, so, Try to imagine all these examples, one after the other. Uh, wh what is the main concept behind? Uh, what is, what is the, the concept that make all these images being of one kind, if you want? Uh, I just had f uh, too few, uh, two more, and uh, that will bring us to the, finally, to this uh, concept. The first uh, one that he had also, it's a, it's a photo that now it's, I would say, more of for tourist publicity or something like that, that shows the Great Barrier Reef uh, in Australia in 1937. I'm told that it's uh, almost destroyed today by pollution and things like that. It was not certainly not as beautiful as you see it in this old photo. Uh, so there, it's kind of uh, kind of garden. You see some fishes and one in in the bottom of the picture on the right, and uh, so it's like a an incredible garden like this, under sea, uh, that could be seen in, in Australia. Uh, and uh, he finished by a photo of Brassai of Crystal. Uh, and Crystal have always been a fascination for Breton. And as you know, when he came in Quebec in 1944, he had this, he knew that uh, somewhere in Gaspé, there was uh, Agathe. Uh, this kind of little stone that you could gather from, from uh, the sea there. And we know that he went in, in Perse, in Lance à fils uh, where he collected these stones. And he thought uh, then after that he could finish his book, Arcane Dicette, in Saint Agathe, uh, because it's the same word, of course, but Saint Agathe is less uh, exciting, <laughs> I think, the, than Lance à fils in Perse and all that. Right? Anyway, but he ended up because of the name Agathe. And all that. So there's certainly a fascination in Breton with stones and with crystal like this and this beautiful photo of Brassailles. But when you think of it, when you think of all these examples that he gave to start with, 
what you have in most of the case, I would say is a case of natural mimetism, as if nature mimicries the uh, form of life. Uh, for, uh, for instance, in this uh, drop of, uh, from the ceiling making the egg appearing, well, it's mineral that are now suggesting a form of life. The uh, mandrake branches or, or roots, rather, that looks like uh, Aeneas where bearing his father on his shoulders. Again, you have a kind of uh, depiction of real life, but through stone. Uh, and the nature that is uh, more or less produced by this image, it's a petrified nature. Uh, it's l like life, but reduced to the state of stone, I would say, uh, petrified. And, um, and always wha what he called veil erotic will be then, every manifestation of life will be transformed like this through to, to, uh, to stone, if you want, or to, to branches or to wood, but will be like inert, uh, as if what was animated in life, it become inanimated in through their petrification. Uh, and this is as when I find this kind of mixture of both, I get excited, and this is what I call conducive beauty. Uh, you, you see the, uh, the other thing, it, which is also almost common to all of them, it is the fact that they are associated like underground or even under the sea, uh, like the, the famous picture of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, we're under the sea. Now we're in the bottom of the sea, and it kind of, uh, I would describe it as a kind of aquatic milieu in which these marvelous phenomena will develop and will create themselves, like corals and, and reefs and things, uh, will be built under uh, underground or on, under the sea. And in the surrealist imaginary, you have always this uh, kind of opposition between the, uh, I would say, the law of the father, uh, the interdiction that you have to resist to, as a surrealist, you are against all this, of course. Uh, and then you, you saw the, the symbol of uh, the, uh, the mandrake, uh, mandrake root, who looks like uh, the son with the father. Uh, and you saw also this little rob, robber statuette that he was fascinated by, was listening. And when you listen, of course, you have a discourse that speaks to you. And again, you are in the, in rather, in the uh, aspect of the law, if you want. But on the other hand, this idea of being underwater and under the ground uh, is also associated, if you want, to more maternal type of symbol, like uh, a fetus in, in the womb of his mother. And this, I would say, most of the, the conflict of the surrealist imagery is hesitating between these two poles. You have all the maternal type of symbols of uh, nirvana, of uh, fantastic uh, uh, pleasure and uh, that n with no interference whatsoever. And on the other hand, you have the law. Yeah? And I never thought of it before, but I, I was asking, but after having uh, thought uh, about this, about Breton, I said some of the Bordeaux painting fits very well with this. Huh? You have here, for instance, the carquois fleury or, or flowered quivers, if you want in English. Uh, uh, it's a painting that we have here at the museum since uh, many, many years now. And uh, in which you do have this kind of feeling that we are underwater. Uh, like if the background here will depict a kind of uh, space that recedes infinitely, uh, like uh, almost uh, to, to a point that you cannot uh, even grasp. And in front of it, you have these quivers who are, um, excuse me, but it's like a rather phallic type of symbols, one beside the others, will uh, be the other aspect. Uh, you have on one hand this kind of uh, maternal uh, aquatic type of uh, suggestion with infinite without any bonder on each side and going receding infinitely on one hand. And on the other hand, you have these, uh, in, uh, these uh, kind of phallic symbols will be more uh, from, let's see, the law, the interdiction, the more to the, uh, yeah, that's good. Uh, do you, I would not see me blushing speaking of all these phallus. <laughs> <and> the <laughs> okay. And uh, so you have, you have this kind of, uh, these two poles in Bordeaux. And also another aspect of Bordeaux painting who could be related to that also, uh, I will illustrate it just by one little example here. I says little, but literally this, uh, this picture is about big like this. Uh, 
He made six of them, and they were discovered very recently. I don't think they have any problem with authenticity. They are not signed. We don't know where they come from exactly, but uh, they look genuinely Bordeaux. But here, what you have by using more and more the spatula, uh, the, the, the painting knife instead of brushes, it creates more, uh, a more mineral type of world, I would say, closer to uh, stone or to mineral formation than to the very smooth biomorphic uh, shape that you will have, for instance, with uh, Dali or other surrealists who were painted with brush and very, very uh, carefully to create a, a very smooth type of transition between, uh, up and, uh, to between what they show and uh, what uh, what they want to, to express. Uh. And in Bordeaux, this importance that he gave more and more to matter and to this technique of the painting knife, I've created a more mineral world also, a more petrified world, if you want, that uh, will uh, join the, the surrealist, uh, in a way. And the, the second concept that you have in, see, you remember the definition I put on, on the wall there of uh, veil erotic, and then after, he spoke of a kind of opposition between movement and uh, immobility, I would say. Uh, and uh, to illustrate it, he used this photo. Or unless it's not really uh, directly in the book that I was mentioning because it was published in, in the magazine Minotaur. And uh, the Minotaur was a beautiful magazine published during uh, the 30s and then a little d during the war in which the surrealists could express their, their, uh, their vision. And here, he says, for me, this is a picture which is fantastic because you have this idea of, uh, of a train, let's say of, uh, of an engine being completely immobilized like this in a virgin forest uh, that have grown uh, around it since years and years and now it's decaying and disappearing. And he said, what fascinated me here, it is the opposition between movement and, of course, fast movement, because normally an engine of a uh, train will go uh, rather fast. Mind you, this doesn't seem very, very modern type of train. It's, it's, uh, it was old already to start with, but anyway. And, the, uh, and, uh, and, and on the other hand, this immobility. Uh, so before you have the opposition between animated and unanimated, and here you have the opposition between mobility and immobility. Uh, uh, the other example that he gave is a fantastic photo of Brassai. Uh, Brassai, again, the kind of uh, very well-known uh, Parisian photographer of the time. It shows a, a tango dancer who is uh, fixed in the middle of a movement in such a way that you don't even see her face. Uh, you can guess more or less that it's a lady with a, with a dress and, and uh, in uh, uh, taken in the middle of movement. Uh, and this, you remember, we made a reflection about photography as such, about the, the relation between photography and the immobilization also, and even in, with death. I say, you remember last time I showed you even uh, an X-ray photos to, to illustrate this idea. You have it here again, in a way, uh, because this, locomo this locomotive, this kind of engine, of train who have been immobilized by the for virgin forest, or here, the dancer taken by a photo in, in, a, in a kind of fraction of second where you can immobilize it, you have again this same idea. And indeed, uh, Roland Barthes, you know, who have made a, a fantastic book about photography in which he, he, he thinks about what it is a photograph really, and in, in French it's called La Chambre Claire, and I think the English translation is something like camera lucida. No? And uh, Bart says this, he says, when I'm, I, I think I can describe it very well, uh, well I think he's, he, he's right to say that. He says, when you are photographed, you are no more a subject and you are not yet an object. No? You, you are losing more or less your uh, identity as an object because you, you stop and you, you except now uh, that I don't give a damn the way, <laughs> the, way, the way I act. But let's say normally, say when you go to the photographer, you stop. So you become an object. But on the other hand, it's not really done. And in fact, what will be produced is a specter. It's something that will be just uh, an image of you uh, who have nothing to do uh, really completely with you. It's one aspect that I've been f fossilized, if you want to have been stopped like this. 
I read back uh, in translation, I said, I am neither subject nor object, but a subject who feels is becoming an object. Uh, this is true. Yeah. Then experience a micro version of death or parenthesis, as if my life is put in parenthesis during the time that I'm photographed. Uh, I have to, to stand and to wait. Okay, now it's over, now I can uh, go back to my movement. And he finished, he says, death is the eidos of the photograph, meaning that eidos means in, in, in Greek, the form. Right? It's a, death is the form of the photograph, meaning that uh, finally this kind of uh, immobilization that photography creates is akin to, to death. Huh? And uh, the third concept of uh, convulsive beauty that is brought by uh, Breton is this, this kind of what he called the magic circumstantial. And this is about, uh, you, you heard that the surrealists were very excited by what they call les trouvailles. Uh, les trouvailles are uh, finds, uh, things that uh, you go to the flea market and suddenly you find this little statuette that I was showing. And uh, they, they were very uh, keen on this type of, of discovery. Uh, I will give you another example of that with, with this, uh, uh, I would say, um, an assemblage done by Victor Browner. Browner was uh, one of the surrealists of the group, and he thought uh, he find this object was very difficult to read. It looks like people bound together, and he thought it was a, a counter-bewitchment uh, device, you know, that to, uh, to resist against bewitchment from other people, you, you use this little statue and all. Oh, anyway, whatever they imagine about the, the, the function of that, I think w what is there, it is this idea that you could have uh, uh, also, that you could find, uh, like this by pure hazard, an object that will speak to you and will be like magical, but also circumstantial because you don't know exactly when it will happen and it's always very contingent. Uh, so if you put these three ideas together, the idea of uh, animation in animation, mobility, immobility, and finally, this uh, idea of uh, hazard objective, uh, in a way, the objective hazard that you can find suddenly, like this, an object that you, you didn't know, uh, will be of interest to you. Uh. And we, when you think of it, we are not so far from the uncanniness that we were speaking last time. Uh. Because again, you have this opposition between life and, de life and death, and the, the kind of limit between both is blurred a little bit. We, we never know exactly what, uh, because each time he insists on the fact that what is fascinating there, it is the fact that this movement is stopped, that this animation is reduced, to petrified, and here that this found, this find that I find in flea market, let's say, or, or in, a, in a little uh, place, uh, uh, at, uh, let's say, an antique shop or something like that. All this have always these two aspects. Huh? You have this kind of line between both uh, become more blurred. And among the finds, there is one that will be interesting for my, so, uh, for Emily Carl, if you want. It is the so-called primitive art thing. Yeah. One of the things that the surrealists w were doing were collecting mask or statues or whatever they could find on the so-called primitive art market. Uh, this one of the fine, one of the trouvailles. Uh, and uh, of course there is already at the time of the surrealism a certain tradition of that. Uh, for instance, we know uh, because Matisse told it how he, he find uh, for the first time an African uh, statuette in, um, in an uh, at in, in antique shop, uh, vieux Rouet. So what you see on the left, it is the, the play of, uh, the, let's see, the, uh, the publicity for, for this place. Was, uh, uh, it must have looked uh, terrible, you know, a kind of little place in Paris where uh, Monsieur Heinemann, had, Heinemann uh, had accumulated a lot of objects like this coming from Africa, Oceania, or, or America and uh, selling them uh, for the first time to, to, uh, to poets or, or to painters. And Matisse uh, told the story that he was going to uh, uh, Gertrude Stein. And so uh, that's nice. You know, he said, I was going on Rue de Fleurus, where Mrs. Stein uh, had her, her place. And my eyes were attracted by this little statuette, and I bought it. 
And there, there was a little party, and Picasso was there. And Picasso, uh, he says, I'm sure that the, the interest of Picasso for uh, African art of that time uh, started with this. He, he, Matisse attributed to himself the idea that he was the first to reveal to Picasso the existence of this type of uh, art and uh, make him very enthusiastic about it. Uh, Matisse himself had made uh, uh, an unfinished uh, still life where he introduced the little statuette that you see, uh, that I show you before. You see it in the middle here. Unfortunately, he didn't finish this painting and uh, it, it, uh, it remains in that stage. Uh, nevertheless, it was bought, so don't worry. <laughs> okay, so the, as much as the Cubist and the Fauve, let's say with Matisse, were avid collectors of so-called primitive art, you have the same phenomenon also among the Surrealists. Uh, and sometimes to, uh, to distinguish themselves, I would say, they will insist on collecting rather oceanic art instead of African art and also heart of the Americas. Uh, they, they, will be, they will try to develop their collection toward this uh, direction. And you see uh, two signs of that. The first is this, when they make a collective exhibition of their work, very often they include also uh, so-called primitive art in their collection. Like for instance here at Charles Raton, uh, you see him on the right there, uh, uh, gallery. Uh, Raton was a collector and uh, uh, sailor also, uh, a marchand, if you want, of uh, primitive art. Uh, so uh, he, he opened his gallery to the surrealists and they make um, uh, what they call an exposition surrealiste d'objets. Uh, what were these objects? Okay, you have some of them, for instance, on the top, on the left, you recognize maybe Picasso guitar. Uh, and then the kind of checkboard there was done by Man Ray. Uh, it's a funny way to play chess because sometimes you have very long uh, cases and, uh, and where left. And then you have also um, in the bottom on the right uh, a sculpture by Giacometti who is quite famous also a kind of ball uh, with a pendulum like this was uh, uh, having a possibility of movement. And among this if you want you see on the wall on the right and also in the middle you have two uh, African masks there. Uh, that are presented like this, like objet surrealist, among others. Uh, and to finish, uh, really, the, the, the mystery of all this, you have even a plant. I don't know if you see it. It's uh, here. Well, almost here. And uh, it was a carnivorous plant. Uh, this is fantastic. A Venus trap, you know. So it adds even to the excitement of all this. So really, the, the concept of objet, there is very large, right? it covers everything. It covers primitive art, it covered also uh, uh, objet trouvé, say things that you can find on the, on the, uh, in nature even. And the other aspect, okay, so this is one of the aspects. When the surrealists make collective show, very often they in introduce in their show also some uh, of these uh, primitive art objects. And also the other aspect, it is they are themselves collectors. Uh, they, they were, for instance, this is Breton in his uh, so-called atelier, in his studio, if you want, where he used to write, and he's submerged by works of art. Uh, they're all around him, uh, and many of them are, in fact, uh, belonging to uh, different uh, uh, tribal hearts, let's say, uh, will, will come from different parts of the world, Oceania and America, and all that. Things that he has accumulated like this with time, and where uh, sold in auction recently. Uh, but but uh, this fact that he's immersed in this type of work is also quite typical, and he's not the only one. You have also Max Cern, so on, many of the surrealists also were heavy collectors of so-called primitive art. Uh, and uh, it's only later, I would say it's through the object, through the collection, let's say, that people like Breton or Ernst or others got interested in the people who made these objects. Uh, so the, let's see, the, uh, the way it's done is from the object to the Indians or to the Oceanian uh, and not the other way around. And so when Breton will uh, quit France in 1941 to go to, the, uh, to New York and to the United States and to live 
during the war period in the United States. At the end of his sojourn there, he will make a trip uh, through all America. And he will end up in New Mexico, California, and all that. And then he will try to visit Indian reservation and to try to, to make contact with his people, of which he, he, he have already collected works. Uh, you see, so it's, uh, the démarche, if you want, is for des objets aux Indiens, uh, and not the, the other way around. One uh, possible influence also uh, that brought him to that, it is his friendship with Levi Strauss. Uh, you know the famous anthropologist uh, Claude Levi Strauss was on the same boat in 1941 that brought Breton to America, out from Marseille, you see, when the, the, uh, the German have already invade France and where there was already demobilization of all the, the army, the French army at the time. Uh, and uh, so uh, Breton and Levi Strauss will, will exchange. And uh, like Levi Strauss mentioned in his book, Triste Tropique, uh, how wonderful it was in New York to discover in the whole uh, Natural History Museum, this all of the Northwest Coast Indian. Uh, and at the time it was like that. Now no museum uh, with, with some respect to the public will accumulate objects like this and present them in such a mess like, like you had at the time. The only thing that was clear was the, the alley in the center, but then you enter in this little cubicle and you have tons of objects to, 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 to see and to visit. Uh. And the, the other, uh, let's say, I, I mentioned that, but also the fact that Breton could go, uh, could make this long trip through America and even to Haiti also to see voodoo ceremony. He ended up also in, uh, uh, in Pueblos, a Navajo people place, a reservation that were uh, active and are still at the time. And he could visit what we call a kiva. A kiva is a kind of structure that is underground and you enter in a kiva by the, by the ceiling, by the top. Uh, you, so you have a kind of stairs. And here's an old photo of uh, 1980 where you see a ceremony inside of the kiva. Uh, the people in the back are shaman, they are healers, and the people, the little boy sitting in front of them is, is ill, is, uh, is sick, and so they are trying to, to save him. And it is these people who see also that were creating these kachina dolls. Uh, what it was, it was like the representation of their gods, but in a small size, and to teach to their children all about their, their ceremony and about their, their belief. Uh, and these were heavily collected, of course, by everybody, but uh, especially by Breton, and by he, he, he brought some of them back to uh, Paris. Uh, another example of these catching adults, they are small, uh, they are not, uh, you don't, uh, now, uh, of course, with the, uh, with the image here, it looks uh, gigantesque, but they, they are small. And in fact, th we have an idea of what they represent because there is some picture that have been done of the costume of different gods like this that you can see on this uh, representation. Yeah? And so, uh, through the uh, fascination to the object, you have, at, uh, with the surrealists, a certain interest in, in the people who were created them. Uh, and uh, I, I could uh, read here a, a reflection of uh, Clifford Browder about Breton and primitive art. And you would say, I think it's rather uh, exact what he says. He says, it's not surprising that Breton developed an early interest in primitive art and that he visited American Indian reservation and witnessed Haitian voodoo ceremonies, providing living proof of the survival among savages of the very state of mind that surrealism will cultivate. In so far as they escape the contamination of Christianity, contamination is in bracket, of course, a primitive society for Breton offered the spectacle of man in harmony with nature, giving unabated expression to the exuberant desires repressed by Western culture. Consequently, hope for the latter lay not in the anthropological study of such societies, but in the uh, recreation of their mode of experience, as if what the surrealists want to do is to recreate a certain mode of experience like these people were experiencing. There's a lot of uh, uh, hidden type of prejudices in this uh, description, uh, like uh, as if uh, these people were expressing just natural desire and all that. 
it's as if they have no culture of their own in a way. Huh? So it's always a little bit ambiguous, but I could imagine that Faubourg thought this was more or less what he, what he found there. And what he wanted to do, of course, is to recreate that. Huh? Now when you go to Emily Carr and you try to compare her attitude toward the object, huh? the object d'art, you have the surprise, the first, he's not a collector. Yeah. When, for instance, you see, have, uh, uh, when you look at photos of her, uh, in her in her house, if you didn't have the little picture behind her that I just uh, reproduced in color on the right, you, you could have no idea that she was interested in, in primitive culture or in Indians and Northwest uh, Coast Indian. Uh, all the pottery that there is on the shelves there have nothing to do with their work. And on the wall, there's nothing else. Uh, and you could see it in many, there's few of these pictures that were taken from uh, in her house like this. And the, the thing that struck me right away, it is contrary to the surrealists who were avid collectors, she doesn't collect Indian art. What she did, she did something very different. She made it. Uh, instead of collecting it, she fabricated things that looks like done by the Indians. And this is a category of object that we don't habitually stress too much when we speak of Emily Carr because it's embarrassing a little bit. Huh? She made, for instance, these rugs. The one on the left is a work by Emily Carr. Huh? And what I put on the right, of course, it's a possible uh, dialogue, let's see, with the motif that she, she took huh, from uh, from the uh, from the Indian from the Indians, huh? and uh, so it's a killer whale, and uh, the of course the the blanket that you see on the right was done much after in 1992, so it it cannot have been influenced to uh, Emily Carr who have done it uh, around uh, in the beginning of the 30s, let's say, but what it what it shows it is that this model of the killer whale, I both in Indian art and what. Uh, let's see, Emily Carr did from it is a kind of very stable type of model that you have in many, uh, uh, have been repeated many, many times, and it's not astonishing that you find similarity in the form of the two, uh, in the two motifs there. Uh. So what happened, it is that when Emily Carr came back from Paris uh, in 1912, she uh, tried to sell her painting but now her style was so different than what she did before that nobody wanted to buy this painting. It was influenced by the faux, were too colorful, were too, uh, uh, they, they were repulsive, let's say, for the good people of Vancouver and, Vic and Victoria. And they, they so she could not sell. And she gives some lessons to children, all that, but uh, she was not always very, uh, prudent with this, she brought the, the children, for instance, on on rail uh, on rails of, of tracks, uh, say of train and things like that. And the parents got all excited. You know, my God, you, you don't do that. She she was trying to bring them in nature and to make picture in front of the motif, but this was not too appreciated. So she she had less and less sources of revenue uh, to survive, if you want. So she decided to do two things. Uh, through an inheritance from her parents, she got the possibility to have a, a house, an apartment house, I would say, built for her, in which she could rent, uh, yeah, at, at least on the, the, the first uh, level, if you want, she could rent apartment to people who come to visit in Victoria. Yeah? And that's what she called the house of all sorts. Huh? She have a book about her uh, memoir, if you want, in which she speak of the hall of all sorts. Uh, this was a, a fantastic thing in a way because, okay, she had some tenants who maybe were quite uh, uh, common people and all that, but she had also very famous people who came to live there. And she made contact with anthropologists and things that were visiting, let's say, Victoria. And uh, they heard about a lady who was making painting of totem poles and things like that. So they, they went there instead of a, a regular hotel. And so she befriends some of these anthropologists, like Herna Gunther, for instance, who was, who became a close friend to her uh, because of that. Uh, and the other thing she decided to do, it is to make um, rugs or pottery uh, uh, inspired by Indian art and to sell it to the tourists. That was her second uh, way of making money, if you want, to survive. And so we have a few examples of these things. 
like this one, uh, another rug, huh? uh, done with the motif of whales, which seems to be more original than the previous one. I didn't find a source here easily. And, uh, but it's probably inspired by things that she have seen or, or that she have uh, taken note about. Huh? Here, this is interesting, this uh, kind of confrontation. On the left, of course, is, a, is one of the rug that Emily Carr did. And on the right, it is a, a so-called button blanket uh, that uh, is done by uh, one of Nazga people there. Uh, and uh, what she interpreted as a kind of eagle with two heads, uh, a little bit like in in uh, the symbol of Germany, uh, where you have an, an eagle with two eggs, is in fact very different. What, what the Indians want to, to do, it is to split the eagle in two uh, and to show it like this fold over in the surface. So it's, there's no two heads there, the same head cut in half and fold over. Uh, so that, that's the, uh, if you want, it's like um, a little bit like in the drawing of, of children, when they, they will put, the, let's say they will represent a car and they will put two wheels in the bottom there and two wheels on the top. And you will say, why you do that? Well, I paint what I know. I don't paint what I see. Huh? So, uh, so they know that uh, a, a bird has two sides. Huh? And uh, so they, they will paint it as they know what it is and not how they see. But then transpose in the, uh, uh, the carpet or the rug done by uh, Emily Carr, you could see that maybe the team of the double-headed he eagle come, come uh, in the surface and is mixed with, with this kind of sources. Uh. Another example, ah uh, yeah, she made also pottery. Uh. These are all Emily Carr's pottery. Uh. They are worth quite, quite, and she was selling them to, to tourists, to, uh, to whatever tourists were, uh, coming in Victoria and uh, wanted to, to get some curios uh, and some uh, Indian art things. She signed them Klee Wick also. Huh? That's interesting. She signed them the name that the Indian gave to her. Huh? And you have one in the middle, the big plate uh, with a kind of beaver type of motif uh, that you have there. Huh? Uh, maybe another example. On the left, it's a platter that she did and uh, probably inspired by some view of the Thunderbird scenes, uh, not in profile like habitually, but in front. Uh, and so I give you uh, on the right uh, a possible source of that. Uh, in the book of Franz Boas, uh, Primitive Art, which is uh, a very famous uh, anthropologist and also, and his book is uh, very well known also. So it, it is as if she made a very simplified version of this Thunderbird. Uh, she even made pin cushions, you see. This was a good idea, of course, because everybody wanted to have one. And, uh, but with a motif of uh, a man that you see, uh, that could be inspired by what you see on the right uh, from the same source. No, it's a city, that means a kind of uh, uh, chair in which the chief could sit and behind him, he have this uh, kind of chair schematic representation of a man that was reproduced more or less by Emily Carr on his little thing. Uh, she was not too, too proud of all this. Huh? She says, uh, I hated to make these works because it was a kind of prostitution of Indian art, but at least I kept pure the motif, huh? as if that was her excuse, you see, to to be as faithful as possible to the motif represented. And, uh, but she, she was not, uh, not sure completely. You could ask, how did she get her information? Where did she get these motifs? Huh? And indeed, we can demonstrate that she went to books, for instance. Huh? One of the famous anthropologists of the time is called uh, John Swanton. And he, he published a beautiful book in 1905. So it's, it's uh, much before her in which you see, for instance, this motif of a uh, tattoo of Haida. And she wrote nearby, it's her writing there, what uh, she understood about it, that this woman insulted the moon and she was taken over by the moon and put in the moon <laughs> like this forever. And uh, that's what you see. She, she, uh, she's wearing a little uh, bag, you know, with seeds to collect, uh, to plant or to collect uh, plants. And on the other side, it's uh, again, a, a design that she found in a book 
and, uh, and uh, have copied carefully in order to be able to use it in her pottery or in, uh, in uh, her rugs. Uh, and al always with this idea of uh, trying to get to uh, the market and make some money to survive. This motif on the left, I've been uh, involved, I just make it in bracket because I like this painter and I work on it a lot. Uh, it, it was, we think, was used by Jackson Pollock uh, in this uh, one of early Jackson Pollock, before the dripping, uh, 1943. But he called it the Moon Woman. You see, again, the uh, association of moon and woman, cut the circle, and, um, okay, you see on the right, more or less the shape of a, a human head with feathers. Uh, we know that women are not allowed to wear feathers uh, among uh, the Amerindians, but for Pollock, it, it doesn't matter too much. But the motif who could be inspired by the, 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 the tattoo that I just showed you before is on the left, uh, this kind of circular thing. And habitually, the Jungian uh, analysts of Pollock have made a lot of fuss about this because indeed, this design is reproduced in Man and His Symbols and the famous book of Carl Jung. Uh, the only problem, it is the book of Carl Jung was published in 1964, so much after the, uh, uh, the painting of Pollock. Unless Pollock could have access to the Swanton book, like Emily Carr, and saw it there, because then there's no problem of date, of course. The Swanton book was published in 1905. That's uh, much before. And so, uh, but I, I just, I was struck when I saw that Emilica was interested by this little drawing. It, re it reminds me of Pollock's uh, uh, involvement with it, uh, possible involvement with it, and I just wanted to make a little parenthesis about that. The, uh, another example of this drawing that she made from books, it's again from the same source, and there she notes even the signification of each uh, near, near one it's a beaver, the other is a, is a thunderbird and all that. She, she really tried to learn all this and to use them after as a kind of uh, uh, helpful uh, to when she says, I kept the, the drawing pure, the motif pure, that's what she meant. She, she went to the sources and all that. Another possible sources, of course, is the real object. Uh, like you see here, it's a drawing of her of Emilica on the left, and the object that we think that she was copying in Ottawa uh, during uh, her stay there, of which I will, I will speak. Uh, but as I told you, she was not very proud of all this. She says, I ornamented my pottery with Indian design. That was why the tourists bought it. Uh, I hated myself for prostituting Indian art. Uh, uh, she saw it like a, uh, and then our Indian did not pot. Their designs were not intended to ornament clay, but I did keep the Indian design pure. Uh, this is what I was alluding before. Uh, in fact, when she says that, she was reflecting an idea that the anthropologists of the time were defending, that all this art, especially even among the Indians, that were done for the tourist trade was inauthentic. And it was a prostitution. And instead of that, what they wanted to collect and what they wanted to show was the, the work done by the Indian before the influence of the whites. Uh, and in a way, you could say that she, uh, uh, she reflect that. On the other hand, she did exactly what the Indians of the time were doing. Uh, it, it's very easy for us uh, to say, uh, this is less interesting art uh, that you do now for tourists and all that. But when it's a vital need, uh, you cannot survive otherwise. And she met, in fact, Sophie, Sophie Frank, that she, uh, I showed you her portrait near her uh, just before. Uh, she met her in that circumstances. Somebody come to her and knock the door gently, she says. And uh, the, this was this Indian lady with a bunch of baskets on her, on her back and selling baskets. And uh, Himiri Carr was always very uh, delicate, if you want. So I have no money for baskets. That's what she told her. And then the Indian woman was clever and said, I don't need money. I could, I could use clothes. And I could use whatever you have. And their friendship starts like that. But what interests me here, it is first of all that um, uh, uh, Sophie Frank was, let's say, uh, doing something that have uh, already a long tradition in, in, 
in, uh, among Indians, you see, too, like in Sins that you could see here in the east of Canada, not in the west, um, a lady of Kaknawaga uh, painted by Cornelius Krigoff, huh? so in the middle of 19th century, and then on the right, another photo about uh, the same time, uh, early photography of one of these Indian lady with basket also going from door to door and trying to sell. What is, what is interesting here, I want to, to stress, this need that the Indians had to sell these things to the white was not just uh, because they, w they wanted to destroy their heart or prostitute their heart. It was an immediate need. Huh? Y you were cut from your, your uh, territory. You could not uh, uh, make a fishing and, and hunting like before. So they had this ingenuity to create to answer the needs of the white population. Uh, they create good baskets, better than uh, whatever they could import from Europe. And they were literally living from that. And the funny thing it is that Emilica imitate them like this, or uh, you could say she's in immediate competition with them with the same type of attitude also with all this pottery and this rug making. Uh, uh, that's why there is a kind of an ambiguity. And now I arrive to a point which is difficult to understand. It is that when in 1927, Eric Brown, of the director of the National Gallery in Ottawa, decided to make a huge exhibition of what he called Canadian West Coast art, native and modern, I said to confront both of them together, he had two attitudes. He asked, for instance, to exhibit uh, the rugs and the pottery of America are part of this exhibition, but any works of art done by the Indian who could be also classified as tourist trade were excluded. Uh, and, and this is an interesting question. So why to have these double standards? For instance, he asked Emilie to make a design who looks Indian uh, for the cover of the catalog. That's what you see here. Uh, it's a Kliwik work. It's a, she signed Kliwik in the, in the bottom on the right. And this is not... Uh, a copy of, of uh, it's not done by an Indian, it's done by America. And if it comes from white, this kind of mixture, uh, this kind of uh, impure uh, <laughs> work, it's okay. But from the Indian, all this is excluded. Uh, so I try, I try to, to find out why it's like that. The first clue you get, it is that Eric Brown, in his essay at the beginning of the catalog, says that the exhibition has two aims. The first one it is, is to give more importance to the art of our autochthonous people, of our indigenous people, and to make it recognized as genuine art. Very good. So the second aim, it is to try to see if there is any connection between what our modern, and he says more sophisticated artists, meaning the whites of course, are doing in connection with Indian art. Is it any connection there? If there is, he said. That's the second aim of it. And this, of course, is interesting because it, he seems to have thought that the, maybe there was a possibility of dialogue between, let's say, modern artists of uh, European Canadian descent and what the Indians were doing. And then, of course, if you define it like a possibility of dialogue, all the rugs and pottery of Emilicar seems to fit that, that uh, demands. Huh? Why it doesn't work in the other direction, this is another problem. Then they wanted to show only what they call authentic art. So 19th century things in which l less possible influence of, uh, of the white will be, uh, will be perceived there. Huh? And in, indeed, when you compare the way that habitually Northwest Coast art uh, Amerindian art was presented in ethnological museum, you will see it's very different when you get to the exhibition of uh, the National Gallery in 1927. Normally in an in a ethnological museum, you have an accumulation of works like this of, and, and everything is put in cases like you see in the bottom there. The big boat, they didn't know where to put it, so they hang it on, on the ceiling. And, the, and each case like this will show, let's say, one culture with different type of objects and all that, and it'll be very, very crowded. Uh, 
And uh, of course, the, 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 the masterpiece of this kind of silly type of presentation was the Trocadero in Paris at the time. Now, no more, the Musée de l'Homme and all this is beautiful. But at the time, this was a crazy accumulation of, uh, for instance, the oceanic room here. And um, we have the uh, a f a very good witness of that at the time. It is Picasso. Uh, Picasso tell the story to André Malraux, of all people, it is a good, a good source, uh, that uh, he visited the Trocadero in 1906-7, uh, just before the Demoiselle d'Avignon. Uh, and I will, I will redo uh, how he reacted because it's so, so typical uh, of this kind of very bad display uh, of, of works of art that were typical of ethnological uh, presentation. When I went to the old Trocadero, says Picasso, it was disgusting. The flea market, it was like a flea market. The smell, awful. I was all alone. There was nobody, of course, who visited that. It, 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 was, it was not a place that you could say. I was all alone. I wanted to get away, but I didn't leave. I stayed. I stayed. I understood that it was very important. Something was happening to me, right? The masks were not just like any other pieces of sculpture, not at all. They were magic things. I understood why I was a painter all along in that awful museum with masked dolls made by the red skin, dusty mannequins, the Demoiselles d'Avignon must have come to me that very day. Uh, but not all because of the form, because it was my first exorcism painting. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and uh, so the, this uh, the fantastic witness that Picasso of this kind of display means that even with their disorder, they were rather efficient. Uh, then compare the way it was presented in Ottawa uh, in 1927. For the first time, you had display of primitive art like this as in an art museum, not like in an ethnology museum. Uh, things are put on the wall and are put on pedestal, very well detached. And here, the strange thing, they are associated also with painting by uh, modern painter. Like for instance, the two little vertical one in the bottom are by Amerikar. And then you have portrait of Indians on each side of the big plaque in the middle uh, by uh, Langon King, who is an American artist that uh, Marius Barbour liked very much and he included the, in the show. And uh, look, for instance, here, it was the same presentation of the work, but when the show was shown in Toronto, uh, this show was to shown first in the National Gallery in Can of Canada in Ottawa, then it moved to Toronto and finally ended up in Montreal also here in the uh, Art Association of Montreal. And you see on the right, you maybe you recognize the carpet of, uh, of uh, America that I just showed you before with the four whales. Uh. So, uh, so this f for Barbeau and Eric Brown who organized the show doesn't make any problem uh, that she should have this type of things inside of her uh, of the show. Uh. And uh, one more of these photo. Well, you see again uh, the. Uh, a possible source of the motif on the pin cushion that I was presented to you with the little man. Uh, you have it here on the, on the left, uh, on the blanket who's there. Uh, and again, associated with, I think in the middle, it's one of her rug, and then associated with some of her paintings. Uh, so that's what he called by modern and na a native and modern, uh, this kind of mixture of the two, uh, the two type of people. But we need to, to get closer to the intention of uh, this, let us see, how many I should have something else there? I don't know, it is up here. <laughs> not, not important, you see, uh, what I wanted to, oh no, I will not go through all this, okay. Uh, I will start back to this and to this. <laughs> Click to add title, yeah, idiot, yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> What you have to, to, to go to, to see a, a more what was the intention there, I think it's uh, the other organizer of the show, was Marius Barbeau, uh, a French-Canadian anthropologist who, was, uh, who made his studies in Oxford you know, and in England and all that, and was part of the or organization. I would say even he was the soul of this show. That for him was a very crucial 
that uh, we should have um, uh, this kind of mixture of modern artists with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, the native. And um, I will read to you a rather lengthy type of quotation because I think it expressed very much what he wanted to do and how he saw the possibility of a new Canadian art through this kind of confrontation between both. I'm not sure I'm, I agree with him, but you will see a little bit what, what he wanted to say. He says, carving, painting, singing, dramatic art, and social standing in the community were all part of each other in the Amerindian community. Uh, he says they had this kind of integration between life and art that we have lost. Uh, and then he go on to give the Indians, let's say, like model to the Canadian to say we should do the same. We should try to do, like they did, a perfect integration of life and art. Uh, and uh, listen how he developed this idea. This is essential to art, he says, that it should form a part of life and not be taken as a mere luxury. Uh, when it is a luxury, as with most of the people of America, it amounts to little or nothing. And what is the penalty? A people without is devoid of self-expression, of soul, a materialistic people. It barely exists. It can just leave its country a vacuous waste in the eyes of posterity. These West Coast nations will live long for their art. The museum of the world now treasure their works, and our artists are turning to their themes for inspiration. You see, like if they had the, the solution, they have a complete integration of art into the community. Uh, it's, uh, it works for them, so why not for us? And it's indeed, I see some hope. There is some of our artists who take inspiration from them. Okay, and then I continue. It has already been said by one critic abroad that the only form of art that we call Canadian is that of the West Coast tribes. You see, the only real Canadian art will be of this Indian, said somebody abroad, we don't know who he is, but whatever, <laughs> the, maybe he invented it, but point of that. Okay, the new American nationalities have not yet come into their own, but the awakening is already with us. Our painting, as an original contribution to the history of art, is already getting recognition abroad. Art to many Canadians is no longer a luxury, but a means of self-expression, a step towards a culture that will someday be distinctly ours. The manifestation of Canadian art, both ancient and modern, are of vital significance. They speak of the country that is ours. They are searching and original. They express the independent personality of remarkable artists. They strive after beauty, a truth, an expression that comes from the soul and the heart. Something of our time will survive and there is little danger that culture, once become a vital part of ourself, will cease to exist. Okay, this text, of course, needs uh, some analysis because at first it looks very nice, this idea of a kind of art mixed with life and the community, and the opposition, of course, of luxury. Uh, art as luxury. Art of luxury means art as something uh, very secondary. Uh, that you can live without, without too much problem, and uh, it's kind of superfluous, I would say, uh, and only some rich people can acquire it and enjoy it. Uh. And you oppose to that, in the contrary, the, the kind of uh, symbiosis, I would say, between art and life that you find in, I think, in the experience of Barbo, there's two places where this happened. Of course, in the West Coast, uh, with the Indian community all along the West Coast, and in French Canada because Barbeau also have worked a lot in the region of Charlevoix, and he speak of this region exactly in the same term. These people, uh, our people, then we could say, because uh, after all he's a French Canadian, he said our people for a, for a time, not, uh, not, not anymore, but in the old days, they used to have this kind of perfect, uh, 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 let's say, uh, immersion of art and life, and what is, what he's referring all the time to as the kind, the ideal, it is what I would call a folk society. Uh, and he see art a little bit like folklore. Uh, uh, the, the, the singing of uh, old songs, the, uh, 
uh, the carpet uh, say, to ornate your, your house by, by yourself, say, the famous Catalogne, like, uh, that our uh, grandmothers were doing. I don't know how, and, uh, but you have them everywhere in, in houses in, in, the, in the country. Uh, and the fact that you could create, let's see, the work of art that you need, you don't have to buy them, you, you just do the things. You have the singing uh, and the oral tradition, you see that he studied so much in Charlevoix and Ile d'Orléans but also always with a kind of uh, a pain saying, well, all this unfortunately disappearing, the influence of the United States is too strong, it's destroying all this. We sell our uh, precious uh, objects, and that's where they go on the market, they become luxury indeed. And you see the, the opposition. But what, what bothered me with this, it is that the solution seems to be in the past and not in front. Huh? And whatever the, he, he, will, he will like to do and, and, and dream of, uh, it's uh, in fact a, a way that the Canadian artists have not really taken. Uh, you have very few examples of what Emile Ricard did. You see the kind of mixture of both traditions. You have Brantner, for instance, uh, that uh, have done a mural with uh, Indian motif for the sea hen uh, wicket in the Boston station but this doesn't exist anymore and the, it have been moved from, from there. And uh, you have also Holgate, huh, who had the contract to decorate with a totem pole and with a, a, a little tea room in uh, Chateau Laurier. It's a very ridiculous type of work. You know, you enter there, two of you, tea at four, at five, and uh, you have totem poles near you. <laughs> it doesn't work, anyway. And uh, happily, Holgate did something else. He didn't stack it. So we have very few examples of this type of mixture. And I think th the artists, the Canadian artists, felt that this is not the way. This is not where we should go. Huh? And first, they have this idea, uh, like if you think of the group of seven, for instance, we should find in the landscape the, the sources of uh, genuine Canadian art. Huh? This was the first solution, in a way. Barbeau tried to save uh, the, the, the situation by saying that the art of the Indians come also from the country, from, from he says, uh, notre terre et notre mer, uh, M -E -R, <laughs> the sea, not, not the mother. And um, so it, ca it comes from, from the same source. Huh? But uh, this is not true. Huh? The, the art of the Indians doesn't come from the landscape. And I'm not even sure that he perceived the territory as a landscape. After all, in our own tradition, the idea of a landscape is relatively recent. Uh, uh, we didn't have it in the medieval time and things like that. It's with the uh, very 18th, 19th century that we began to perceive the, the outside, let's say, of a landscape. Uh, so you don't need to have this concept to be able to create a form of art. Uh, and so, and what's more ambiguous also from an ethnographer like uh, Marius Barbeau, if you explain the art of the Indian only through a relation with nature, you put in bracket their culture uh, and their history also. And, the, and uh, there's many other things that they, could, they would like to, to see and to, to tell. Uh, so that, I think, even it was the intention and it explained why he could include uh, this type of work of Emile in his show in 1927 in, in National Gallery, I think also you, you have to be criti critical about it and to see the limit of this type of choice. Huh? And in conclusion, I would say, if we had only the carpet and the pottery of Emile uh, we will not speak of her any, uh, today. Huh? Okay. Okay. We have one more, and then you will be free. <laughs>